Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamancing. Tonight, the long weekend so many have been waiting for. Few restrictions, but plenty of risk. As people gather concerns, they're not protected. The third dose is the charm. The stalled booster campaign with more than a million doses trashed. Russia strikes back, turning its fire back on Ukraine's capital after the loss of a key warship. It's difficult to accelerate more. And Russia's stark warning for the U.S. Remembering an NHL great, one of the best scorers ever. I just uh, shoot the puck on the net. Mike Bossy's legacy on and off the ice. What's beer? Right. What's Bohemian? Yes. What is Dracula? Yes. The 23-year-old Canadian on a Jeopardy winning streak. I'm really shocked and moved, actually, by the extent to which people have really gotten behind me. Can we stump the champ? You ready for this? Oh, I'm ready. Let's play. <laughs> OK. <laughs> this is The National. You may be gathering with family and friends this weekend for Easter, Passover, or Ramadan. And for the first time in three years, most public health restrictions have been lifted. But in the midst of a sixth wave, experts worry this long weekend could supercharge the spread. Part of the problem, many are not as protected as they could be. Most Canadians have two doses of the vaccine, but only 47% have a third dose booster. And that single shot makes a big difference. We'll get into why so many are hesitating. But first, let's hear from some Canadians still weighing the risks of getting together. Here's Deanna Sumanak johnson Sandra Ha has put health and safety before family traditions for two years now. My family is Catholic, so Easter is a very special, uh, a very devout part of the year for us. This year, they plan to have a celebration, but small. They want to include a grandmother who lives in a retirement home. For our mental health and for her mental health, we felt it's like really important for, to involve her as part of this celebration. Many families across Canada are making similar calculations. On the one hand, it's the first major holiday weekend without any restrictions since the pandemic began. On the other, cases are skyrocketing in many provinces, driven by the ultra-contagious subvariant of Omicron. In Toronto, reminders that things are not back to normal, not quite yet. The program getting people vaccinated on subway platforms rolling into one extra weekend. The man behind it, Toronto Mayor John Tory, himself in isolation because he tested positive. Across Canada, public health officials have urged caution. But whatever you're celebrating this weekend, given where we're at and the amount of COVID that's around us, it's critically important that people still uh, remember that uh, follow the COVID safety protocols. The virus is still very um, contagious in the community. In Ontario, fears this weekend could lengthen the sixth wave, which is showing some early signs of plateauing. We could still hit more hospitalizations. Um, you know, hospitalizations take one to two weeks after illness. But this doctor says, even so, we're not where we were at this time last year. We have very effective tools, notably uh, uh, vaccination, uh, immunity in general, and also we have antivirals that are, are coming and uh, there are other therapeutics on the way. As Canadians face another spring of hope tempered by trepidation. Deanna Sumanak johnson CBC News, Toronto. Something that might give you peace of mind about gatherings is more people getting their third dose vaccine. They're now widely available, but interest is low across the country. So low, more than a million doses have gone to waste. Julia Wong looks at why more Canadians aren't rolling up their sleeves. So this is coming to expiry sometime soon. COVID-19 vaccines at Yakut Elawash's pharmacy may soon go to waste because he is not giving out many booster doses. Recently, in the last couple months, I'd say, the interest has dropped really low. More than 80% of Canadians are fully vaccinated with two shots. But when it comes to booster doses, nationally, numbers drop to 47%. In Alberta, just 36%, the second lowest in the country after Nunavut. There are a number of reasons people are not rolling up their sleeves. Confusion over when to get a third dose is one, especially if that person got COVID. Complacency is another, since most public health measures have been lifted. 
it's sending sort of an underlying message that the pandemic is over, we don't need to worry anymore. So people don't feel um, that it's important. This immunization expert says messaging is also critical. Other provinces have said they're in a sixth wave. Alberta is more reluctant. Um, whatever we term it, whether it's called a, a sixth wave, we certainly all know the kinds of things that can help protect ourselves and those around us. But COVID hospitalizations are rising. Two doses of vaccine are 57% effective in preventing hospitalizations if you're more than six months out, according to a CDC study. That jumps to 90% with a third dose. The third dose is the charm. It, it is what gives us the advantage that Omicron tried to take over. This is kind of an arms race, and so if we want to battle Omicron, we need a booster. Fourth doses have opened up for some older and immunocompromised Canadians. But experts say when they open up to the general public, that will be another battle, saying the more doses people are told they need, the harder it will be to motivate people to get them. Julia Wong, CBC News, Edmonton. Turning now to Canada's effort to support Ukraine, another 100 Canadian troops have been deployed to Poland to help refugees fleeing Russian aggression. This is why we do this job. Uh, our soldiers are excited and ready to get in there and uh, start help make a difference. 80 soldiers, including a medical unit, left Edmonton today. They were followed by another 20 from CFB Trenton. The force also includes chaplains and mental health professionals, along with Ukrainian language translators. The linguists will simply be supporting those specialists as they execute their duties, such as the medical aid, spiritual guidance. The Canadian contingent will help Polish authorities process refugees at reception centres across the country. This new deployment bolsters the Canadian troops already in eastern NATO countries under Operation Reassurance. And in the Ukrainian capital region, the grim task of recovering bodies goes on two weeks after the Russian withdrawal. Authorities now say they have found the remains of 900 civilians in and around Kyiv, most shot, and police say it appears they were simply executed. Meanwhile, the Kremlin remains silent about casualties on its Navy flagship, the Moskva. U.S. officials today confirmed it was struck by Ukrainian missiles before sinking under tow this week, a loss the Russians are now treating with fury. Chris Brown shows us how they're firing back. Stung by the loss of its most important naval asset, Russian missiles pounded Ukraine's capital Friday morning, hitting an ammunition factory. Expect more attacks on Kyiv, said the Russian military spokesman as he accused Ukraine of terrorist acts. Whether he was referring to the Moskva, which Ukraine claims it hit with two anti-ship missiles, isn't clear. All Russia has said that its flagship vessel in the Black Sea was damaged in a fire and sank in bad weather being towed to port. In Russian-occupied Crimea, where the Moskva was based, there was a memorial Friday. It was a symbol of our power, he said, without a hint of irony, but bizarrely made no mention of what was surely on most people's minds, the fate of 500 crew members. A Ukrainian military spokeswoman said, we saw other ships trying to help, but the storm didn't allow them to carry out the rescue operation. On Russian state TV programs, there was fury from some who blamed Ukraine anyway, despite the official position it was an accident, as well as from the host, who claimed Russia is already fighting World War III because of all the weapons NATO has provided to help Ukraine, even though Ukraine says the Moscow was hit by Neptune missiles that it designed and built itself. I see the number of uh, troops uh, involved it's, diff it's difficult to escalate more. If this Ukrainian analyst says Russia's warnings about escalating the war are empty, as it already has as many forces in Ukraine as it can get. And he said the threat to cause more damage in Kyiv is mostly intended to keep up morale in Russia. Of course, they make some damage, but uh, the timing of this damage, it's, it's for political reason. Russian forces were pushed out of the Kyiv area two weeks ago, but remain within artillery distance of cities in the east, such as Kharkiv and Mykolaiv, where 10 civilians were killed in attacks on Friday. The loss of a naval ship at sea is unlikely to stop Russia from pursuing its offensive on land. 
Chris Brown, CBC News, Kyiv. Russia is now directly warning the U.S. to stop shipping weapons to Ukraine, but when it comes to its own citizens speaking out against the war, it's going far beyond threats. Friar Stewart shows us how Russia is cracking down on those who dare to dissent. Inside this computer repair shop, the screen reads that a poster had to be taken down because of a fine of 100,000 rubles. That sign read, no war. Murat Grachev and his staff put it up at the end of February. We've not heard any negative words from our customers and visitors, he said, but at least once a day we heard words of gratitude or support. That changed at the end of March when a passerby reported the business to police, who questioned Grachev and demanded he come down to the station. Grachev is one of more than 400 people who have been detained for what Russia calls discredited the military or publishing fake news. This woman was jailed for replacing price tags with stickers detailing facts about the war. On Wednesday, police crashed a concert that featured some compositions by a Ukrainian composer, but this pianist defiantly played on. OBD Info is a human rights group that has been providing legal support in many of the recent cases that the rhetoric is changing. For example, you can hear Putin's speech about um, national traitors and uh, foreign agents and uh, that we need to find these people. Then there are those who were already very much on the Kremlin's radar. It is a regime of murderers. Vladimir Karamurza was arrested just hours after giving this interview to CNN. He's a vocal critic of Putin's government and has ended up in the hospital twice after suspected poisoning. His wife says he's officially charged with trying to evade police, an accusation she calls ridiculous. Her husband has been sentenced to 15 days in custody for now. We're not yet sure if this will be the end of it uh, because we fear that um, during these 15 days they might come up with something else to charge him with. Because Russia is trying to crush all opposition in a country where even benign protests are met with severe response, the loudest voices can become the biggest targets. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Riga. Tensions also rose today in the Middle East. Early morning violence broke out between Israeli police and Palestinians in Jerusalem. As we mentioned, these are holy days for three world religions. Sasha Petrasik shows us what happened in a city that is special to all of them. The sun was rising over Jerusalem's holiest Muslim site, early prayers just underway, when the violence flared. Protesters at the Al-Aqsa Mosque threw rocks at Israeli police, then barricaded themselves inside. Police burst in, firing rubber bullets. In all, more than 150 Palestinians were injured. The Israelis, they brutally emptied the compound, he says. The clash has come at a particularly sensitive time for Muslims, Jews and Christians, who all jammed the old city of Jerusalem as Ramadan, Passover and Easter Friday coincide, some hoping for an elusive peace. It's incredible. It's a miracle to be here and to share this, this Holy Friday with all the people and to pray for everybody. We pray here for the peace. Tensions have also been running high in Israel and the West Bank, sparked by weeks of confrontations. Palestinian militants have launched attacks inside Israel over the continued occupation with 14 people left dead. You can't help thinking what will be, what will be the passive experience of those families um, who weren't expecting to have one person left at their table. Um, and it's really, a, it's really a national pain. Israeli forces have responded, killing 15 Palestinians mourned at West Bank funerals. The last time there were major clashes in Jerusalem, they sparked an 11-day war between Israel and Palestinians in Gaza. Those militants have promised some kind of response to this latest violence as well. Sasha Petrasek, CBC News, Washington. 
CBC News has learned where the Pope will visit in Canada on a trip planned for July when he's expected to make further apologies around residential schools. Sources say Pope Francis will make three major stops at Calouet in the north, Edmonton and Quebec City. That would leave out many places where the Catholic Church ran those schools. Lindsay Duncombe asked some Indigenous people what they hope to see. Indigenous and Catholic rituals meld on this Good Friday at St. Paul's Squamish Nation Church. Deacon Rennie Nahaney is disappointed British Columbia does not appear to be on Pope Francis's Canadian itinerary. If it wasn't for the unmarked graves in Kamloops, we wouldn't, this event probably wouldn't even be taking place. The heartbreak unleashed by the discovery of what's believed to be 215 unmarked graves at this former residential school was a catalyst for last month's Indigenous delegations to Rome. The delegates say the Pope's plans are up to the Church. We have to let the Catholic Church and the CCCB own their decisions um, and not get involved as Indigenous people in being the gatekeepers for the winners and the losers. The Canadian Council of Catholic Bishops has said this trip will not be like previous Pope's multi-city marathons, citing Francis's advanced age of 85. At Good Friday services at the Vatican, his movement seemed strained. Church officials surveyed locations for the visit in Iqaluit last week. The Métis National Council is hopeful that Francis will make it an hour outside of Edmonton for the Feast of St. Anne. It is a special site, a spiritual site, a healing site for Métis peoples. Rennie Nahaney may travel to Alberta. He hopes money will be set aside to help survivors from across the country attend the events. I think the people here need to hear those words for them to move on. Because I think they're kind of trapped as five, year, five years old, six years old. How can you get rid of those memories? However briefly, the Pope will visit communities bearing heavy pain, and expectations are high that his words will help heal. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, North Vancouver. Gas prices in Canada's biggest cities are set to get even more expensive. It uh, brings the real feeling of the inflation. I don't know, I should have filled up more just now. It's pretty nuts. Starting at midnight, prices are expected to jump by as much as 12 cents a litre in some areas. That could mean as high as $1.85 in Toronto and $1.93 in Montreal. Experts say that jump is the result of a short supply of fuel. Some RBC customers woke up today to cash missing from their accounts. Some took to Twitter to complain that deposited e-transfers disappeared. RBC blamed technical issues and has apologized, saying the problem is fixed. More than 30 farms across the country are in lockdown tonight over concerns about a highly transmissible strain of avian flu. As Kyle Bax explains, efforts to stop the virus could affect your grocery bill. Typically, there's an open door policy at Country Lane Farms. These days, though, with the threat of the avian flu, the gates are shut. It's stressful for us farmers. That's why we're out here in the cold and not inside my warm shop. Only the farm manager is allowed inside the barns. That's it, just one person. We're doing our best to keep it out. The avian flu circulates almost every year, but this strain, known as H5N1, is especially transmissible. This particular strain is very severe because we're seeing it impact wild birds. In the past, wild birds have frequently been carriers, but haven't fallen ill themselves. But we're seeing some wild birds get ill this time as well. The avian flu is already hitting Europe and the U.S. hard, killing 20 million birds south of the border, at the same time putting a dent into the supply of chicken and eggs and driving prices up. Your morning breakfast price is going up, all the way from the eggs but to the bacon and the toast and everything else. As wild birds migrate north for the spring and summer, positive cases on farms are climbing. There are more than 30 across the country, resulting in 500,000 birds killed or euthanized. Retail chicken prices are already up across the country compared to a year ago, mainly because of rising fuel and other expenses. If the avian flu continues to spread, prices could climb higher. If you start looking at millions and millions of birds uh, euthanized, that would become a problem for sure. At Country Lane Farms, there was a price increase last year. Now with feed costs up 75%, there might be another hike. 
The main focus, though, is locking down the barn and keeping the virus out. Kyle Bax, CBC News, near Chestermere, Alberta. A tribute at Bell Centre in Montreal tonight for a hometown NHL hero. Next, remembering Mike Bossy and the legacy that goes well beyond his Stanley Cup wins. Plus, why animal hospitals across Canada are at a breaking point. Well, I've seen tears and just like people wanting to leave the profession. Matea? What's beer? Right. What's Bohemian? Yes. What is Dracula? Yes. And we put the Canadian on a Jeopardy hot streak in the hot seat. You ready for this? Oh, I'm ready. Let's play. <laughs> We're back in two. CBC News, The National, named Canada's best national newscast at the Canadian Screen Awards. And the number 31, number 31, Carey Price! Have superstar goalie Carey Price making his season debut tonight at Bell Centre against the New York Islanders. Last fall, the 34-year-old had made the decision to enter the NHL's assistance program due to substance abuse. And it wasn't the only emotional moment. The team and fans paid tribute to one of hockey's legends, Mike Bossy. The Islanders' great died last night of lung cancer. Cameron McIntosh shows us Bossy's impact on the game. Look out for this one. Scores! He was the speedy guy with the hard shot, a natural goal scorer, Mike Bossy was a true game changer on and off the ice. I don't really have uh, a secret about scoring goals. Just uh, shoot the puck on the net, and uh, a lot of times it ends up in the net. In the late 70s, Bossy dominated the Quebec Major Junior League, but 14 NHL teams passed him over, thinking he couldn't play the rough and tumble game of the Bruiser era NHL. The New York Islanders took a chance. I think that I've accomplished uh, a great deal by, for myself, just making the team. He scored 53 goals that year. Playing with finesse, he took the shots while racking up the goals, helping to usher in a new era focused on scoring. He scores! In 1981, he became only the second player to score 50 goals in 50 games, one of his nine 50-plus goal seasons. That's never been done before in the NHL. He and Gretzky, uh, Wayne Gretzky, both had uh, nine seasons, but uh, Mike's were cons consecutive. And there's the guy holding it up. Who was With the goals came four straight Stanley Cups, helping cement the Islanders as one of hockey's greatest dynasties. Well, it's not a coincidence. It's uh, Johnny Keane. I got 100 points that year. For a season, Brent Sutter played on a line with Bossy. He remembers his determination. He wasn't afraid to, to uh, you know, to take a pounding around the net that he did to get to get the goals that he did. But Bossy wasn't quiet about it. He never fought, but spoke out against violence in the game. His injuries were cutting his career short. I feel that I have to go out there and and prove to myself every game that uh, that I still have what it takes to play in this league. After just 10 seasons, 573 goals, Bossy retired at 30. A proud Montrealer, he went on to have a long career in broadcasting after teaching himself French. Fittingly tonight, his Islanders were playing in Montreal, a moment of silence observed at center ice for one of the game's most gifted scorers and fiercest advocates. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. Harry and Meghan made a rare public appearance at the Invictus Games in the Netherlands. Harry's a founder and patron of the competition for injured veterans. This was the couple's first event in Europe since they moved to the U.S. more than two years ago. Canadian veterinarians say their industry is on the verge of a crisis. Well, I've seen tears and just like people wanting to leave the profession. Next, why so many are burning out. And later, how Twitter plans to fight off a hostile takeover by billionaire Elon Musk. Welcome back. If you've had trouble booking a vet appointment for your pet, you are not alone. There's a growing shortage of trained veterinarians and staff in Canada. Lindsay Duncombe shows us what's driving some to quit and what's making it so difficult to replace them. 
Across Canada, animal hospitals and clinics are at a breaking point. Too many appointments, not enough staff. Well, I've seen tears and just like people wanting to leave the profession um, and, and, and people leaving the profession. Lucas just got dropped off. Okay. Dr. Rocky Liss and two partners just opened Skyline Animal Hospital in North Vancouver. It might be too small to get it. Today, Dr. Liss needs to decide if Lucas needs surgery. Meow Meow is getting prepped to have a mass removed from her abdomen. Hey guys, how's it going? And while that happens, Dr. Liss checks in on Jack, a senior golden doodle overdue for vaccines. It's at the very least constant and at times feels quite frantic. We did an aspirate and it was... Dr. Liss and his colleagues can barely keep up. There is a shortage of veterinarians um, and we're seeing that acutely right now. Casey Meikle is a registered vet tech, essentially a nurse for many species. She's worked in the industry for more than a decade and has never seen it like this. We are busier now. There is, you know, waiting lists for vaccine appointments, which never used to happen. There's waiting lists for surgeries that are just your typical spay surgery or neuter, neuter surgery. And those are things that I've never experienced before COVID. Even before the pandemic, the Canadian Veterinary Medical Association warned of a staffing shortage. Then COVID-19 made everything worse. The CVMA says that 30% of veterinarians and 50% of veterinary staff are in the advanced stages of burnout. I was not able to be the veterinarian that I wanted to be, and I did get burnt out. When Dr. Carissa Mitchell started her career, she was prepared for the intensity of working with sick animals. Emotional owners were harder. I can't stand here and say that that doesn't affect us on a day-to-day -day basis. It is. It definitely wears you down emotionally. All right, good boy. Owners complained about bills and questioned decisions. The money from your bill is not just going directly into veterinarians' pockets. It's to pay for the medicine and for the supplies and the resources that we use. The pandemic meant owners couldn't come into the clinic and all those new puppies needed checkups. It became too much. Dr. Mitchell sought counseling and quit. She now fills in at other clinics and sets her own hours. I love my job, but I am nervous for the future of my profession if um, no changes are made. There are five veterinary schools in Canada. They're highly competitive and students can only attend the program in the region where they live. In total, Canada's vet schools graduate less than 400 Canadian vets each year, a number that barely matches anticipated retirements. The Western College of Veterinary Medicine in Saskatoon has come up with a solution to graduate more vets, but it comes with a price that's directly borne by veterinary students such as Ruth Patton. It was a dream come true. When I got into vet school, it was, well, I should say it was a dream come true, and it was also devastating. Patton is from B.C. The province funds 20 seats for vet students. She didn't qualify for one of those, but she did qualify for a new unfunded seat, a program that allows Canadian students to pay international tuition. It's an extra $55,000 per year in addition to the regular tuition, so it's about $69,000 in tuition fees alone uh, per year for the four-year program. Oh, thank you for being here, honey. On average, veterinarians make ninety to hundred thousand dollars a year, and many are small business owners without benefits. Patton knows money worries will add stress to an already stressful career. I think a lot of people don't realize we we don't make the same amount as medical doctors, human doctors. So, it's an amount of money that is going to be difficult to pay off in this profession. I empathize with it. I really, really do. If you actually carefully just run. Your Dr. Chris the Clark is the associate dean no academic at the college. He says the profession can take a toll on mental health, so the college is changing its curriculum. What you're going to do is remove the overgrown wall. It's actually in addition to clinical skills like this goat herding workshop, these fourth year students will learn about teamwork, personal finance and wellness. And starting next year, there will be new resiliency training. And that that's a really comprehensive program that focuses on um, learning skills that you will then develop through your profession to help you deal with challenging circumstances and challenging people, both of which happens in veterinary medicine all the time. Dr. Clark says the shortage so of veterinarians means all of his students of will find work. Right now, they probably have more options than any generation that's ever graduated. Dr. Liss removes the mass from Meow Meow's abdomen. 
It doesn't look like cancer, but a lab will confirm. Left leg will be... The patients continue to pour in. There's even a backyard chicken, lethargic, with a sore foot. Definitely feels me like a whirling feeling at the end of the day, so... <laughs> and that's every day, and that, I, I don't think that's sustainable. Okay, have a good night. The work doesn't end when the last patients leave. There are still calls to make and tomorrow to plan for. It promises to be another busy day. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, North Vancouver. After our story on vet shortages was published on cbc.ca earlier this month, the B.C. government announced new funding to train veterinarians. Ten additional spots will be fully funded starting next year. That means Canadian students currently paying those international tuition rates can expect their debt load to be somewhat reduced. When we come back, a Canadian Jeopardy winning streak continues. That's $28,001 for today and a nine-day total of $210,802. Next, our conversation about her newfound fame, what makes a great Jeopardy contestant, and we're going to see if we can stump her. The sauce is a blend of evaporated milk, vinegar, garlic powder, and sugar. Think you know? Our interview is right after the break. Welcome back. You may remember Canadian Matea Roach. We introduced you to the 23-year-old last week when she'd won two games in a row on Jeopardy. Now, she's up to her ninth win. Did she know it was Spike Lee? She did. Potential for another big payoff today. Hope you bet a bundle. 6,201. That's $28,001 for today and a nine-day total of $210,802. Congratulations to you. So that's just over 265,000 Canadian in winnings. I spoke to Matea earlier today and put some of our own trivia questions to her. Matea, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, by your own count, uh, it's been more than a dozen interviews so far about Jeopardy, media all across the country. What's this newfound celebrity been like for you? Uh, it's been quite overwhelming. Obviously, I've known for a while that this was going to unfold in one way or another. Uh, at once I won my fifth game and knew I would be going to the Tournament of Champions, I figured there'd be some amount of interest. But I'm really shocked and moved, actually, by the extent to which people have really gotten behind me in my Jeopardy run. People really have gotten behind you. I mean, there's, there's a lot of support and love for you across the country. Um, and a lot of people wondering this, this kind of basic question, like, what does it take to be a repeat Jeopardy winner? Um, well, the first thing I think it takes is a lot of luck. I would say you need luck, first of all, to even get to the stage where you're going to be competing. It takes a good memory. It takes a thirst for knowledge, I would say, because certainly I wasn't studying up in preparation for going to Jeopardy, and then that's how I learned all the responses I was able to give. Uh, you know, you need to, I think, be a sponge for knowledge throughout most of your life in order to be successful multiple times. And there's a strategic element to it, too, and you have to try and make sure that you're playing the game in a way that's going to maximize your chances of victory. Yeah, you're being modest, obviously. You need to have a really <laughs> big brain filled with a lot of information, being able to handle and process that information very quickly, all of which you've managed to do. And you need to have a tolerance for kind of cheesy moments in an interview by an interviewer. And we're going to have one of those cheesy moments now because we're going to play a little Jeopardy. So please bear with us. Three questions for you. I'll give, you know how this works, the answer, and you have to uh, respond in the form of a question. You ready for this? Oh, I'm ready. Let's play. <laughs> okay, here's the first one. He was the high school debate coach who got a shout-out on Jeopardy. Oh, who is Brian Casey? This is the easiest Jeopardy ever. <laughs> I know, but you know what? I wanted to mention Brian Casey. I remember him from years and years ago when I was involved in debating. But more to the point, uh, I love the fact that you have cited high school debating as something that, that has helped you with success, particularly dealing with the pressure of Jeopardy. Tell me about that. I would say that what debating did for me is it made me very, very comfortable with situations where you are not 100% sure what subject matter you're going to encounter and where you have to stand on stage in front of, you know, in this case, millions of people in their homes. But in the case of debating, sometimes, you know, upwards of 100 people that are there in a room with you uh, and demonstrate your knowledge and be able to do so in a way where you come off as at least moderately personable. Yeah, it's helped me a lot, too, in my business. So shout out for debating, and I'm glad that you had a chance to do that. Okay, here's the second one. This is a little tougher. Here we go. The sauce is a blend of evaporated milk, vinegar, garlic powder, and sugar. 
A sauce? Oh, Don what is Donaire sauce? Yes. There you go. <laughs> and, and the reason I ask you that is because obviously you're from Halifax and people in Nova Scotia have embraced your story. You mentioned your aunt did a, a really good job of, of making sure everybody she talked to knew you were about to be on the show. But tell me about the response in Nova Scotia. The response in Nova Scotia has been so overwhelming that I'm almost glad to be in Toronto because I'm sure I wouldn't be able to leave my house. Like <laughs> you already can barely, as, as you know, having lived in Halifax, you can barely, you know, go out anywhere without running into somebody that you know. And when you're on television, you know, everybody feels like they know you, which is, I feel so lucky that people have been so supportive and been so excited. Um, I'm very proud of being from Nova Scotia. That's why it was so important to me to represent that aspect of my background on the show. And so... I'm, I really hope I'm making people back home proud. It seems like I am. I, I love it. I think you were panicking for like a split second as you were trying to come up with the donor sauce answer. So <laughs> I, I quite enjoyed that moment. Um, our third and final answer here, 74 consecutive games. Oh, uh, what's the record for the longest streak on Jeopardy? Yeah, Ken Jennings, obviously, the guy who had those 74 consecutive. Do you feel an increase in pressure as your win total starts to, to get longer? So as I was playing through the games, actually, I think I felt a, a decrease in pressure I, as I went through because I never expected to go down and win even one game, let alone, you know, the nine games that have aired so far. So for me, everything past the first game and, and you know, famously, I sort of said, well, now I can pay off my student loans. Beyond that, everything was gravy because that was my wildest possible dream when I got the call to go on Jeopardy was, wow, it would be awesome if I was able to win enough money to pay off that debt. Did you say your student loan is My now? student loan is paid off. That's Congratulations. It. That's it. There it is. It's gone. Um, no, so I think as the shows continued to tape, I just started having more fun with it because I thought, you know, how often do you get to play one game of Jeopardy, let alone multiple? So much about you is so impressive. You know, obviously you have this big body of knowledge in your brain. You're clearly so articulate. So I think it's important, and we chatted about this before we went to air, uh, to point out that even somebody like you isn't guaranteed success academically. I think there might be some 18 and 19 year olds out there who might be a little comforted by your first two years in university. Tell us about that. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I was a great student all through high school. And then a funny thing happened, which was that I started university uh, at 16. I turned 17 about two years into it. And I think that for a lot of people making the transition from high school to university, especially if you end up moving to a different city or a different province as I did, uh, it can throw you off your rhythm in a pretty significant way. And so I spent a lot too much time uh, taking naps during the day instead of going to class, <laughs> uh, too much time listening to Best of the Smiths on repeat all night. Uh, and so it took me really until partway through my third year and then even into my fourth and fifth year because I took extra time to find a rhythm and really, I, uh, you know, even find coursework that activated me and then I felt passionate about. So for people who feel like they may be flopping their way through high school or their early years of undergraduate um, studies, it really doesn't always have to be that way. There's ways to pick it up and there's plenty of smart people who uh, do not have the most shining transcripts, I'll say. <laughs> Yeah, you are uh, d just a delight to interview and to watch. And uh, thank you very much for speaking with us. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. And Matea keeps winning. The company behind Facebook is the latest tech giant to announce it's setting up shop in Toronto. Next on The National, what the tech boom means for smaller Canadian startups. He must have done something. No, he just doesn't like me. Doesn't like you? How could anyone not like you? <laughs> American actor Liz Sheridan died this morning at her home in New York. You might remember her as Jerry's mom on Seinfeld. He wrote on Twitter, Liz was always the sweetest, nicest TV mom a son could wish for. Liz Sheridan was 93. Elon Musk's bid to take over Twitter seems to have hit a snag for now. The company's executive board has adopted a so-called poison pill that would allow its other shareholders to buy more shares at a discount, in turn diluting Musk's stake in the company. The billionaire has offered to buy Twitter for $43 billion U.S. Companies like Twitter have a constant need for top talent. And when a big player sets up in a hub like Toronto, like Facebook's parent company recently did, smaller tech firms struggle to keep staff. Jamie Strachan looks at how they might fight back. Let me say, it was not an easy task 
to convince Meta to invest in Ontario and in Canada. Facebook's parent company recently committed to bringing 2,500 jobs to Toronto, joining other Silicon Valley giants like Google, Microsoft and Twitter in Canada's largest city. But the boom has a downside. Many established Canadian success stories are struggling to hire and keep the talent necessary to thrive. What we've seen is 70% of businesses are struggling to find the proper digital talent they need. There isn't enough talent in Canada at this moment. Hi Mama is a simple and easy to use app. That the daycare app Hi Mama is a success story that's gone from small startup to 200 employees, but the Toronto company is feeling the pinch. Some of the, the pa compensation packages we're seeing out there, we've never seen before. Big salaries in the U.S. have made it a challenge to attract skilled workers like engineers to Canada. So they've reached farther afield to places like Nigeria and Brazil. We're not just outsourcing or finding talent abroad um, to work remotely uh, into perpetuity. We want those folks to come to Canada. Um, and so for these folks in particular, selling Canada uh, and everything that Canada and our country has to offer. The company is also making it easier to continue to work from home. The other thing that we've done is put at the top of our priority list proximity to Union Station. Being close to Toronto's main transit hub makes it easier to come into the office when necessary. Talent isn't just a Toronto problem. This tech boom is rippling all across the country. In so-called Silicon Harbor in St. John's, smart thermostat company Misa offers its roughly 100 employees non-monetary benefits. What we really try to sell on is being part of our mission and, and the purpose of why we exist as a company, which is to fight climate change. And I think when people align themselves with their employer of a, of a shared mission and goals, it's something they can get really excited about. But perks aside, this generation of tech workers still desires change and seem willing to leave even good companies for new challenges. I think most importantly is building a company that has the culture that normalizes that people come and people go and to make sure that we are not in a position where one person leaving breaks us. It's all the new reality in a sector where nothing, it seems, stays the same for long. Jamie Strachan, CBC News, Toronto. From the technology of the future to a trip back into Calgary's past. One man's passion project hits the road and turns some heads. The moment is next. Check out this blast from the past cruising around Calgary streets. Its owner is Nick Blonsky. He's a pilot by training and he suddenly found himself with a lot more time on his hands when the pandemic hit. Then he stumbled across this 1982 Calgary Transit bus. Blonsky, with the help of some friends and his dad, restored the battered bus back to its glory days. And tonight, it is all our moment. My name is Nick Blonsky. I'm 24 years old and I own this bus. I've always been interested in buses since junior high or so. Back when I was in high school, these buses of this model were still in service with the city. These kind of formed a very memorable part of my childhood. One day, one of my friends told me that he found one of the buses of this model just kind of sitting on an acreage, just rotting away. We went down there and we found out that the owner was open to selling it, so I bought it. It was a couple grand to buy just the shell, but I got pretty lucky and got a pretty good deal because it was operational and it was in pretty good shape for what it was. Obviously, I spent many more thousands just getting all these seats and stuff and the mechanical work that it needed. It was just a matter of putting Lego together from that point. It turns heads all over the place. You'll go by an intersection, there's people standing there, they're like, wow, that's cool. Bus drivers obviously find it cool too. I used to drive that bus, yeah. If an opportunity comes up to take this thing out and pose it for some cool photos in some cool places, I'll definitely jump on it. So a 1982 bus, our director Stacy says she remembers those when she was younger, it made us wonder how old she is, but I checked, that bus was in service until 2011. So Stacy, you're, you know, maybe not as old as I thought you were originally. Uh, that bus, by the way, called the Fishbowl. GM said it was nicknamed that way because of the way, I guess, the windows were. Anyway, I'm sure lots of people are enjoying the nostalgia of seeing those pictures. That is The National for April 15th. I hope you join me Sunday for Cross Country Checkup on CBC Radio and CBC News Network. And later that night, right back here for The National. Good night.